What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another deep space sci-fi horror tale. And I hope you're enjoying these stories and ready for some creepy, cosmic chills. As always, I love reading your comments. So leave them below. Let me know what you think. Give suggestions. Or just say hi. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. And remember, to laugh a little, it's good for the soul. When you're done here, be sure to check out my other scary stories. I've got a ton of terrifying tales to give you goosebumps. Alright, let's get this sci-fi nightmare started. Get ready for some creepy, otherworldly thrills. The year is 2247. We finally found it. A Dyson Sphere, a colossal alien megastructure enveloping a distant star a testament to a long-vanished civilization. Euphoria gripped the scientific community. Humanity's greatest dream, a source of limitless energy, lay within reach. I was one of the lucky few selected for the first manned mission to the Dyson Sphere. As the lead xenologist on the team, my job was to study the remnants of the alien civilization, to uncover the secrets they left behind. We called it Project Prometheus, a fitting name for a mission that promised to bring fire from the gods. Our ship, the Astral Pioneer, was equipped with the latest technology, FTL drives, advanced AI, and a crew of the best and brightest from around the world. We traveled for months through the vast emptiness of space, our destination a beacon of hope and mystery. When we finally arrived, the sight of the Dyson Sphere took my breath away. It was larger than anything I had ever imagined. A shimmering shell of metallic panels stretching across the void. The star it encased glowed faintly. Its light filtered through the structure's semi-transparent surface. We docked at one of the sphere's entry points. A massive airlock that led into the interior. The anticipation was palpable as we prepared to step inside. Our suits were equipped with sensors and cameras ready to document every detail. As the airlock doors opened, I felt a chill run down my spine. The interior of the Dyson Sphere was unlike anything I had ever seen. Vast, cavernous spaces filled with strange, luminescent flora and towering structures of unknown purpose. The air was thin but breathable, and the gravity was slightly weaker than Earth's. We moved cautiously, our footsteps echoing in the alien silence. My first priority was to find any signs of the civilization that built this place. We explored for hours, documenting everything we saw. Strange symbols adorned the walls, and we found devices that defied explanation. But there was no sign of life, no bodies, no remains. It was as if the builders had simply vanished. As we ventured deeper into the structure, we began to notice something odd. The plants seemed to move, ever so slightly, in response to our presence. At first we thought it was just our imagination, but the phenomenon became more pronounced. The plants would twist and turn, following us with an eerie, silent precision. Then we found the chamber. It was a massive, circular room filled with intricate machinery. In the center stood a towering obelisk, covered in the same strange symbols we had seen throughout the sphere. The air was colder here, and the light from our suits seemed to dim as we approached the obelisk. Suddenly the symbols on the obelisk began to glow, and a low hum filled the chamber. We froze, unsure of what was happening. The hum grew louder, vibrating through our suits, and the light intensified. I felt a surge of excitement and fear. Had we activated some ancient technology? Were we about to unlock the sphere's secrets? Then, without warning, the hum stopped. The light faded, and the chamber was plunged into darkness. We stood in stunned silence, our hearts pounding in our chests. Whatever we had done, it had triggered something. Something that was now awake. The silence was deafening, broken only by our ragged breaths. We fumbled for our suit lights, casting nervous beams across the chamber. The obelisk loomed ominously, 
its symbols no longer glowing but somehow more menacing in the dark. Did we just turn something on? Sarah, our engineer, whispered, her voice trembling. I don't know, I replied, trying to keep my own fear in check. We need to stay calm and figure out what just happened. Suddenly, our ship's AI, Athena, crackled over the comms. Commander, I'm detecting a power surge throughout the Dyson Sphere. Systems are coming online. Athena's calm, robotic voice was a stark contrast to our rising panic. What kind of systems? I asked, already dreading the answer. Energy readings are off the charts, Athena responded. Unknown devices are activating across the structure. I recommend immediate evacuation. Understood, I said, my mind racing. Everyone back to the ship, now. We moved quickly, retracing our steps through the labyrinthine passages. As we ran, the sphere seemed to come alive around us. Lights flickered on, casting eerie shadows, and the strange plants writhed more aggressively, reaching out as if to grasp us. We finally reached the airlock and scrambled inside. The doors sealed shut behind us, and I breathed a sigh of relief. We were safe, for now. Back on the Astral Pioneer, we gathered in the command center to review the data we had collected. The atmosphere was tense, and everyone was on edge. Look at this, Sarah said, pointing to a monitor. These readings show a massive energy spike originating from the obelisk. What could it be? Dr. Ramirez, our physicist, asked. A power source? A communication device? Or a weapon, I suggested, the possibility sending a shiver down my spine. As we debated, Athena interrupted. Commander, I'm detecting movement outside the ship. We turned to the external cameras, and my blood ran cold. The plants, now glowing with a sinister light, were slowly converging on the astral pioneer. Their tendrils slithered across the hull, probing and searching. We need to get out of here, I said my voice tight with urgency. Athena, prepare for immediate departure. Acknowledged, Athena replied. However, I must inform you that the docking mechanisms are not releasing. Something is holding us in place. Panic surged through the crew. Can we override it? Sarah asked, already working on her console. I'm trying, Athena said, but the sphere's systems are overriding our commands. Then we'll have to find another way, I said, trying to think. Sarah Ramirez, suit up. We're going back out there. We donned our suits again, the weight of the situation pressing down on us. As we exited the airlock, the alien tendrils recoiled slightly, as if sensing our determination. We moved cautiously, cutting through the vines with our tools, trying to free the ship. It was slow, painstaking work, and the plants seemed to grow faster than we could cut them. My heart pounded as we fought against the relentless onslaught, our situation growing more desperate by the minute. Then, without warning, a loud crack echoed through the air. We turned to see a section of the sphere's wall sliding open, revealing a passageway filled with an otherworldly light. The tendrils stopped their advance, almost as if they were waiting. We have no choice, I said, feeling a mixture of fear and resolve. We need to find out what's in there. It might be our only way out. With a final glance at the astral pioneer, we stepped into the unknown, the alien light swallowing us whole. The passageway led us deeper into the heart of the Dyson Sphere. The walls glowed with a soft, pulsing light, casting eerie shadows that danced with each step we took. The atmosphere was thick with tension, every sound amplified by the silence. Stay close. I instructed, glancing at my companions. Sarah and Ramirez nodded, their expressions a mix of fear and determination. We moved cautiously, our suit lights sweeping the corridor ahead. The passageway opened into a vast chamber, its ceiling lost in darkness. Strange machinery lined the walls, humming with a faint, rhythmic pulse. In the center of the room stood another obelisk, smaller than the one we had encountered before, but equally imposing. This looks like a control room, Sarah said, her voice barely a whisper. Maybe we can find a way to disable the sphere's systems. As we approached the obelisk, its symbols began to glow once more. The humming grew louder, resonating through the chamber. 
I reached out, my fingers brushing the cold, smooth surface of the obelisk. Instantly, a surge of energy shot through me, and my mind was flooded with images. I saw glimpses of an ancient civilization, their technology far beyond our own. They had built the Dyson Sphere as a sanctuary, a final refuge from an existential threat. But something had gone wrong. The images became chaotic, filled with scenes of destruction and despair. The last image was of the obelisk, a final act of desperation to contain the catastrophe. I stumbled back, gasping for breath. It's a containment system, I managed to say. They built this to trap something inside. But what? Ramirez asked, his face pale. I don't know, I admitted. But whatever it is, it's still here. We turned our attention back to the obelisk, searching for any clues that might help us understand how to control it. Sarah discovered a series of panels that seemed to respond to her touch, revealing complex schematics and data. I think I can deactivate the locking mechanism, she said, her fingers flying over the controls. But it will take some time. Hurry, I urged, glancing nervously at the dark corners of the room. The feeling of being watched was growing stronger, an oppressive presence that seemed to press down on us from all sides. Minutes felt like hours as Sarah worked, the tension mounting with each passing second. Finally, she let out a triumphant cry. Got it. The docking mechanism should be released now. Relief washed over us, but it was short, lived. The chamber began to shake, and the machinery emitted a high-pitched whine. What's happening? Ramirez shouted, his eyes wide with fear. I don't know, Sarah replied, frantically checking the controls. Something's overriding the system. Before we could react, the floor beneath us gave way, and we were plunged into darkness. We fell for what felt like an eternity, our screams swallowed by the void. When we finally hit solid ground, the impact knocked the wind out of me leaving me gasping and disoriented. We found ourselves in a cavernous underground space, lit by a faint, otherworldly glow. The walls were covered in the same strange symbols, but these were different, more chaotic and distorted. We need to find a way back to the ship, I said, struggling to my feet. Stay together and stay alert. As we moved through the underground labyrinth, the sense of unease grew stronger. The walls seemed to pulse with a sinister energy, and the air was thick with an unnatural chill. We were not alone down here. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the shadows. It was humanoid, but twisted and deformed, its eyes glowing with a malevolent light. It let out a guttural hiss and lunged at us. We fought with everything we had, but the creature was incredibly strong and fast. It took all three of us to bring it down. And even then, it continued to thrash and screech until it finally lay still. What was that? Ramirez panted, his face pale with fear. I don't know, I replied, my heart pounding. But we need to keep moving. There could be more of them. We pressed on, the sense of dread growing with each step. The further we went, the more it felt like the sphere itself was alive, watching and waiting. And then we saw it. In the center of a massive chamber, surrounded by strange machinery and pulsating light, was a massive containment pod. The symbols on its surface glowed with an eerie intensity, and I knew instinctively that this was what the ancient builders had tried to imprison. We had awakened something far more dangerous than we could have ever imagined, and now it was up to us to stop it. The containment pod dominated the chamber its dark, pulsating surface exuding a palpable sense of menace. We approached cautiously, every instinct screaming at me to turn back, but I knew we had no choice. Whatever was inside that pod was the key to understanding what had happened to the Dyson Sphere's creators. We need to find a way to secure this thing, I said, my voice tense. Sarah Ramirez, see if you can figure out how the containment system works. They nodded and set to work examining the strange machinery that surrounded the pod. I kept my eyes on the shadows, every nerve on edge. The memory of the deformed creature we had encountered still haunted me. As Sarah and Ramirez worked, 
The chamber seemed to come alive around us. The symbols on the walls glowed brighter, and the machinery emitted a low, ominous hum. The sense of being watched intensified, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we were running out of time. Commander, I think I've found something, Sarah said, her voice trembling with a mix of excitement and fear. These controls seem to regulate the containment field. If I can adjust the settings, we might be able to reinforce the barrier. Do it, I urged, glancing nervously at the shadows. Whatever it takes, just do it. As Sarah manipulated the controls, the pod began to shake. The symbols on its surface glowed brighter, and the air around us crackled with energy. Ramirez worked alongside her, his face set in grim determination. Suddenly, the pod emitted a deafening roar, and a blinding light filled the chamber. We were thrown to the ground, the force of the explosion knocking the wind out of me. When the light finally faded, I looked up to see the containment pod split open, its dark contents spilling out into the chamber. A massive, amorphous entity emerged, its form constantly shifting and writhing. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, a swirling mass of darkness and light, exuding an aura of pure malevolence. It turned its attention to us, and I felt a cold, unrelenting dread wash over me. We have to get out of here! Ramirez shouted, pulling me to my feet. We can't fight that thing! But as we turned to flee, the entity lashed out its tendrils of darkness wrapping around Ramirez and lifting him into the air. He screamed in agony as the tendrils tightened, and I watched in horror as his body was consumed by the entity, his screams abruptly silenced. No! I screamed, grabbing Sarah's arm. We have to go now! We ran the entity's roars echoing behind us. The labyrinth seemed to shift and change, the walls closing in as if trying to trap us. My heart pounded in my chest, the adrenaline propelling me forward. We finally stumbled into a smaller chamber, and I slammed the door shut behind us. We were breathing hard, our minds reeling from the terror of what we had just witnessed. What do we do? Sarah asked, her eyes wide with fear. I don't know, I admitted, trying to think. We need to find a way to contain it again. There has to be something we can use. As we searched the chamber, I found a console that appeared to control the sphere's internal systems. It was ancient and complex, but I was able to decipher some of the symbols. I think I can activate a secondary containment field, I said, my fingers flying over the controls. But it will only be a temporary solution. We need to find a more permanent way to stop that thing. Sarah nodded, her face set in determination. Do it. We'll figure out the rest later. I activated the containment field and the chamber shook as the sphere's systems responded. We could hear the entity's roars of frustration, but the sounds grew fainter as the field took effect. We need to get back to the astral pioneer, I said, turning to Sarah, and we need to make sure that thing stays contained. We retraced our steps through the labyrinth, the sense of dread still hanging heavy in the air. As we moved, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that the sphere itself was aware of our presence. When we finally reached the airlock, I felt a surge of relief. We entered the ship and sealed the doors behind us, the familiar hum of the astral pioneer's systems, a comforting sound. But as we prepared to depart, I couldn't shake the feeling that our troubles were far from over. The Dyson Sphere held many secrets, and we had only just begun to uncover the darkness that lay within. Back aboard the astral pioneer, we wasted no time in reviewing the data we had collected. The sense of urgency was palpable, the memory of Ramirez's horrific death still fresh in our minds. We needed answers, and we needed them fast. Athena, I called, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside me. Can you analyze the data we retrieved from the control room? We need to know everything we can about that entity. Of course, Commander, Athena replied. Her calm, artificial voice a stark contrast to the chaos we had just escaped. Initiating analysis now. As Athena worked, Sarah and I sat in the command center, trying to make sense of what we had experienced. The alien machinery, the symbols, the containment pod, it all pointed to a civilization that had faced an unimaginable threat. Athena, what do we know about the builders of the Dyson Sphere? I asked, hoping for some insight. 
The data indicates that the builders were a highly advanced species, Athena explained. They constructed the Dyson Sphere as a sanctuary, a final refuge from a cataclysmic event. The entity you encountered appears to be the cause of that event. It is a being of immense power, capable of consuming and corrupting living matter. Why would they create a sanctuary that houses such a creature? Sarah wondered aloud, her brow furrowed. It appears they were attempting to contain the entity, Athena replied. The Dyson Sphere was not just a refuge, but a prison. The builders sacrificed everything to ensure that the entity would be trapped within its confines. A chilling realization washed over me. And we've just set it free. Sarah's eyes widened in horror. We have to warn Earth. If that thing gets out, we need to find a way to reinforce the containment field, I said, my mind racing. Athena, is there any information on how to permanently neutralize the entity? There are references to a fail-safe mechanism, Athena responded. A final contingency plan designed to destroy the entity if containment failed. However, the data is incomplete. I will need more time to analyze it fully. Do whatever it takes, I ordered. And in the meantime, prepare the ship for departure. We need to get this information back to Earth. As Athena worked, Sarah and I prepared the Astral Pioneer for the journey home. The sphere's docking mechanisms had been released, and we were able to undock without incident. But as we moved away from the Dyson Sphere, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. The entity was still out there, and we had only delayed the inevitable. As we set course for Earth, Athena continued her analysis. Commander, I have identified a possible location for the failsafe mechanism. It is located deep within the Dyson Sphere, in a secure chamber that appears to be heavily fortified. Can we access it? I asked, my heart sinking at the thought of returning to the Sphere. It will not be easy, Athena admitted. The chamber is protected by a series of complex security systems. However, it is our best chance to neutralize the entity permanently. I glanced at Sarah, seeing the same determination in her eyes that I felt. We have to go back, she said her voice resolute. We can't leave that thing out there. I agree, I said, nodding. Athena, set a course back to the Dyson Sphere. We need to find that failsafe and finish what we started. The journey back was tense, the weight of our mission pressing down on us. As we approached the sphere once more, the sense of dread returned, stronger than ever. We docked at a different entry point, closer to the location of the failsafe chamber. As we stepped back into the alien structure, the atmosphere felt even more oppressive. The sense of being watched more intense. With Athena guiding us, we made our way through the labyrinthine passages. The sphere's security systems were still active, and we had to navigate a series of traps and obstacles designed to keep intruders out. It was slow, painstaking work, but we pressed on driven by the knowledge that the fate of our world depended on our success. Finally, we reached the entrance to the failsafe chamber. The doors were massive, covered in the same glowing symbols that we had seen throughout the sphere. As we approached, they slowly slid open, revealing a room filled with ancient machinery and a central console. This is it, Sarah said, her voice filled with awe. The failsafe mechanism. We moved to the console, examining the controls. Athena provided guidance, helping us decipher the complex alien language. As we worked, the chamber began to hum with energy, the machinery coming to life. We're almost there, I said, my heart pounding with anticipation. Just a little more and we can end this. But as we activated the final sequence, the chamber shook violently and a deafening roar filled the air. The entity had found us. The chamber trembled as the entity's roar reverberated through the walls. The failsafe mechanism's activation had drawn its attention, and now we were face to face with the creature we had unwittingly unleashed. The amorphous mass of darkness and light surged into the room, its malevolent presence filling every corner. Keep working! I shouted to Sarah, my voice barely audible over the cacophony. We have to activate the failsafe! Sarah's hands flew over the controls, her face a mask of concentration and fear. The machinery hummed louder, 
the symbols glowing with an intense light. But the entity was closing in, its tendrils reaching out towards us. I grabbed a plasma cutter from my belt and lunged at the creature, trying to buy Sarah more time. The tendrils lashed out and I felt a searing pain as they wrapped around my arm. I struggled to free myself, but the entity's grip was like iron. Commander! Sarah screamed, her eyes wide with terror. Keep going! I shouted back, gritting my teeth against the pain. Don't stop! Athena's voice crackled over the comms. The failsafe sequence is almost complete. Hold on a little longer. With a surge of determination, I managed to break free from the entity's grasp. But it was relentless. The room shook again, and I saw cracks forming in the walls. We were running out of time. Suddenly, the central console emitted a blinding light, and a shockwave of energy rippled through the chamber. The entity let out a deafening roar, its form convulsing and writhing in agony. The failsafe mechanism was working. Sarah, get back! I shouted, pulling her away from the console as the energy intensified. The machinery hummed with an otherworldly power, and the symbols glowed brighter than ever. The entity thrashed and screeched, its form destabilizing as the failsafe mechanism did its work. The room was filled with a blinding light, and I shielded my eyes, feeling the heat of the energy surging around us. Then, with a final ear-piercing scream, the entity exploded into a burst of light and darkness. The shockwave knocked us off our feet and we were thrown against the walls. When the light finally faded, the chamber was silent, the air thick with the scent of ozone. I struggled to my feet, my body aching from the impact. Sarah, are you okay? She nodded, her face pale but determined. We did it. The entity is gone. Athena's voice came through the comms, calm and steady. The failsafe mechanism has successfully neutralized the entity. The Dyson Sphere is secure. Relief washed over me, but it was tempered by the knowledge of what we had lost. Ramirez was gone, sacrificed in our desperate fight against the Entity, and the builders of the Dyson Sphere had paid an even higher price, their entire civilization wiped out by the creature they had tried to contain. We need to get back to the ship, I said, helping Sarah to her feet, and we need to make sure this place stays secure. We made our way back through the labyrinth. The sense of dread replaced by a solemn determination. The Dyson Sphere was a tomb, a monument to a civilization's desperate struggle against an unimaginable threat. And now, it was our responsibility to ensure that its secrets remained buried. Back on the Astral Pioneer, we set course for Earth. The journey home was quiet, the weight of our mission pressing down on us. We had succeeded but at a great cost. The knowledge we had gained was invaluable, but it was tempered by the loss of a friend and the realization of the true nature of the universe's dangers. As we approached Earth, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the cosmos held. The Dyson Sphere was just one of many mysteries waiting to be uncovered, and I knew that humanity's journey into the stars was only just beginning. We would return to the Dyson Sphere one day, better prepared and more cautious. But for now, we carried with us the knowledge that even in the darkest corners of the universe, there was hope. And as long as we had that, we would continue to explore, to discover, and to protect. The astral pioneer touched down on Earth, and we were greeted as heroes. But the real victory was the knowledge that we had gained, the lessons we had learned. We had faced the darkness and emerged stronger for it, and as we stood on the steps of the ship, looking out at the stars, I knew that our journey was far from over. The universe was vast and filled with wonders and dangers beyond our imagination, and we were ready to face them, no matter the cost, for in the end it was our curiosity, our courage, and our determination that would guide us through the darkest nights and into the light of a new dawn. The return to Earth was bittersweet. We had achieved something monumental, but the cost weighed heavily on us. Ramirez's absence was a gaping hole in our crew, a stark reminder of the dangers that lurked in the depths of space. Yet our mission had not been in vain. The data we brought back from the Dyson Sphere was invaluable, 
offering insights into an advanced civilization and their desperate struggle against an unimaginable threat. The debriefing with the United Earth Space Command was intense. We shared every detail, from the discovery of the Dyson Sphere to the encounter with the entity and the activation of the fail-safe mechanism. The scientists and military officials listened with rapt attention, their expressions a mix of awe and concern. We have a lot to learn from this. Dr. Halsey, the head of the Scientific Council, said, her voice filled with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. The technology, the knowledge of the builders, it's beyond anything we've ever encountered. But we must proceed with caution. The entity you described is a stark reminder of the potential dangers. Agreed. General Lawson, the military commander, replied. We need to ensure that such threats are contained and that our exploration efforts are well prepared to handle anything we might encounter. In the weeks that followed, the data from the Dyson Sphere was analyzed and studied by the best minds on Earth. The technology and knowledge we had brought back sparked a new wave of innovation and discovery. But the shadow of the entity and the sacrifice of Ramirez were never far from our minds. Sarah and I were hailed as heroes, our names etched into the annals of space exploration history. But for us, the accolades meant little compared to the responsibility we felt. We had seen the darkness that lay beyond the stars, and it was our duty to ensure that humanity was prepared for whatever came next. One evening, as I sat in my quarters aboard the Astral Pioneer, now docked at Earth's premier spaceport, I received a message from Dr. Halsey. She wanted to discuss something urgent. I made my way to the research facility. My curiosity peaked. Commander, Dr. Halsey greeted me warmly. Thank you for coming on such short notice. Of course, I replied. What's the matter? She led me to a secure lab, where a holographic projection of the Dyson Sphere hovered in the air. We've been analyzing the data you retrieved, and we've made some significant discoveries. The failsafe mechanism you activated was just one part of a larger system. It appears that the builders had a contingency plan to evacuate and rebuild elsewhere. What do you mean? I asked, intrigued. The Dyson Sphere contains star maps and coordinates to several other locations, she explained. Potential refuges or outposts created by the builders. If we can locate these sites, we might uncover even more advanced technology and knowledge. A sense of excitement and apprehension washed over me. The thought of more discoveries, more secrets to uncover, was exhilarating. But it also meant more risks, more unknown dangers. What's our next move? I asked, my mind racing with possibilities. We need to mount an expedition to one of these locations, Dr. Halsey said. With your experience and the Astral Pioneer's capabilities, you're the best choice to lead this mission. I nodded feeling the weight of the responsibility once again. I'll do it. We'll prepare the ship and the crew for another journey. As I left the research facility, I couldn't help but look up at the night sky. The stars shone brightly, each one a beacon of mystery and potential. Our journey was far from over. The universe was vast, filled with wonders and dangers beyond our comprehension, and we would face them head on Driven by our insatiable curiosity and unyielding determination, the astral pioneer would set sail once more, charting a course for the unknown. For in the endless expanse of space, there were always new frontiers to explore, new challenges to overcome, and new discoveries to be made. And we were ready. This week has been crazy. Everything will change so much in a year and a half. It all started on 11-22-21-27. I passed the NASA test, but then NASA was replaced by the UAF. This was good for me. I got a job as a new astronomer. At first, nothing seemed to change. But for us, it was big. We got to work in space. We made new rockets and satellites. After a year, I moved up. I joined a team looking for aliens. For five months we found nothing. We almost gave up. Then we got a new telescope. It was the best ever made. We started looking for aliens right away. 
After a month, we found something. It still scares me. We found a Dyson sphere, but it was empty and broken. The star inside was cold. I keep wondering, what happened to the aliens? Did they leave, or do they not need it anymore? We told everyone three days ago. The world went crazy. Governments want to build a spaceship. They want us to find a way to go faster than light. How can we do that? We only reached light speed 20 years ago. Can we really go faster in just a year? I can't sleep. I keep thinking about the Dyson Sphere. What if the aliens are still out there? What if they're watching us? What if they're coming here? Today I went to work early. The office was empty. I turned on my computer and saw a weird message. It said, We see you. I thought it was a joke. But then all the screens in the room turned on. They all showed the same message. I ran to get my boss. When we came back, the screens were normal. My boss didn't believe me. He said I was tired and seeing things. Maybe he's right. Maybe I'm going crazy. But what if I'm not? What if the aliens are real? What if they're trying to talk to us? I need to find out. I need to know the truth. Tomorrow we start working on the new spaceship. We'll call it Explorer 1. It's going to be the fastest ship ever made. I hope it's fast enough to reach the Dyson Sphere. I wonder what we'll find there. Will there be clues about the aliens? Or will it be empty, like a giant ghost town in space? I'm excited, but I'm also scared. What if we're not ready for what we find? Today was weird. I got to work and found a note on my desk. It said, look closer. I didn't know who left it. I turned on my computer. The screen showed the Dyson Sphere. I zoomed in. At first, I saw nothing new. Then I noticed something strange. There were lights on the sphere. I called my team over. We all saw the lights. They blinked in a pattern. We realized it was a message. But we couldn't read it. We worked all day to decode the message. Finally, we got it. It said, help us. We were shocked. The aliens were alive. We told our bosses right away. They didn't believe us at first. We showed them the proof. Then they got scared. They told us to keep it secret, but I couldn't keep quiet. I had to tell someone. I called my best friend, Sam. I told him everything. He thought I was joking. Then I sent him a picture of the lights. Sam got quiet. Then he said, What do we do now? I didn't know. We talked for hours. We tried to figure out what the aliens needed help with. That night, I had a strange dream. I was floating in space. I saw the Dyson Sphere up close. It was huge. I heard voices coming from inside. They were calling for help. I woke up sweating. The dream felt so real. I wondered if the aliens were trying to talk to me in my sleep. The next day I went back to work. Everyone was busy. We were trying to build the spaceship faster. We knew we had to hurry. The aliens needed our help, but something felt off. Some people were acting weird. They wouldn't look me in the eye. I heard whispers when I walked by. What were they hiding? I checked my computer again. The lights on the Dyson Sphere were brighter now. The message had changed. Now it said, hurry. My heart raced. What was happening to the aliens? I tried to tell my boss about the new message. He wouldn't listen. He told me to focus on my work. But how could I? The aliens were counting on us. As I left work, I saw a strange car parked outside. Two men in black suits were watching me. I felt scared. Were they from the government? Did they know about the aliens? I ran home and locked the door. I felt like I was being watched. I couldn't shake the feeling that something big was about to happen. And I was right in the middle of it all. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept thinking about the aliens and the men in black suits. When morning came, I was tired but ready for work. At the office, things were different. Guards were at the door. They checked everyone's ID. Inside, more guards watched us work. It felt like a prison. My boss called me to his office. He looked worried. He said, We need to talk about the alien message. I thought he would finally listen. But then he said, You can't tell anyone else about it. It's top secret now. 
I felt angry. People needed to know. But I nodded and went back to work. I didn't want to lose my job. Later, I overheard two guards talking. They said something about a plan B if the aliens were dangerous. It scared me. What was plan B? At lunch, I sat with my friend Mia. She whispered, Did you see the new paper on your desk? I shook my head. She said, Check it when you get back. It's important. I rushed back to my desk. There was a folded paper hidden under my keyboard. I opened it carefully. It said, Meet at the old library at midnight. Bring no one. Tell no one. My heart raced. Who sent this? Was it a trap? Or was someone trying to help? The rest of the day dragged on. I pretended to work, but I couldn't focus. I kept watching the clock, waiting for midnight. Finally, it was time to go home. As I left, I saw the men in black suits again. They were talking to my boss. I hurried past them, trying not to look suspicious. At home, I paced around my apartment. Should I go to the library? It could be dangerous. But I had to know what was going on. At 11.30, I left my apartment. The streets were empty and dark. I felt like eyes were watching me from every shadow. I reached the old library at 11.55. It was closed and dark. I waited, my heart pounding. Then, at exactly midnight, a side door opened. A voice whispered, Quickly! Inside! I took a deep breath and went in. The door closed behind me. Inside, I saw five people. I recognized Mia and Sam. The others were strangers. One of them, an older man, stepped forward. He said, We know about the aliens. We know the government is hiding things. We want to help. Are you with us? I looked at their faces. They seemed scared but determined. I thought about the alien message, the secrets, the guards. I knew I had to make a choice. I took a deep breath and said, I'm in. What's the plan? The old man smiled. He said, Good. We need you. He pointed to a big map on the wall. It showed our city and the UAF building. We're going to sneak into UAF, he said. We need to get more info about the aliens. The government is hiding too much. Mia spoke up. I found out they're building a secret ship. It's faster than the one they told us about. They want to reach the aliens first. I was shocked. Why keep it secret, I asked. Sam answered. They're scared. They think the aliens might be bad. They want to be ready to fight. The old man nodded. But we don't know if the aliens are bad. We need to find out more before they do something stupid. He showed us his plan. We would sneak into UAF at night. Mia would hack the computers. Sam and I would look for secret files. The others would keep watch. It was risky. If we got caught, we'd be in big trouble. But we had to try. We spent hours planning. We learned the guard schedules. We got fake ID cards. We even practiced what to say if someone caught us. As the sun came up, we were ready. The old man said, Rest today. We move tonight. I went home, my mind racing. Could we really pull this off? What would we find? I tried to sleep, but couldn't. I kept thinking about the alien message. Help us, they said. What if we were their only hope? That evening, I got ready. I put on dark clothes and packed a small bag. I looked at myself in the mirror. Was I really going to do this? At 10 p.m., I met the others near UAF. We were all nervous. The old man checked our gear one last time. Remember, he said, if anything goes wrong, we run. Don't try to be a hero. We nodded. It was time. We snuck up to the back of the building. Mia used her hacking skills to open a side door. We were in. The halls were dark and quiet. We moved slowly, checking every corner. My heart was pounding so loud I was sure someone would hear it. We reached the main computer room. Mia got to work. Her fingers flew over the keyboard. Sam and I started searching for files. We found lots of papers about the aliens in the Dyson Sphere. Suddenly we heard footsteps. Someone was coming. We froze, not sure what to do. The door started to open. We held our breath, ready for the worst. The door opened slowly. We all held our breath. But it wasn't a guard. It was one of our team. He whispered, Hurry, we don't have much time. We stuffed papers in our bags. Mia copied files from the computer. We worked fast, scared but excited. Then Mia gasped, Guys, look at this. 
We crowded around her screen. It showed a video from a secret space probe. It was near the Dyson Sphere. We watched in awe. The sphere was huge. Parts of it were broken, but we saw movement inside. The aliens were real. Suddenly, alarms went off. Red lights flashed. We heard shouts in the hall. We've been found out, Sam yelled. We ran. The halls were a maze. Guards chased us. We split up, hoping to confuse them. I found a window and climbed out. I fell into some bushes. It hurt. But I got up and ran. I ran for what felt like hours. Finally, I stopped in a dark alley. I was alone. Where were the others? I checked my bag. I still had some papers and a small drive Mia gave me. At least we got something. I waited until morning, then snuck home. I was scared and tired, but I knew I had to look at what we found. I turned on my computer and plugged in the drive. There were lots of files. Most were boring reports, but then I found something big. It was a message from the aliens. Not just help us, but a long letter. It told a scary story. The aliens said they built the Dyson Sphere to save their dying world. But something went wrong. Their star started to die faster. They tried to fix it but couldn't. Most of them died. The rest went into deep sleep hoping someone would find them. The message ended with, If you're reading this, please hurry. We don't have much time left. I sat back shocked. We had to help them. But how? The government thought they were dangerous. They might try to stop us. Just then, I heard a knock at my door. My heart raced. Was it the police? Or my friends? I walked to the door slowly. I took a deep breath and opened it. It was Sam and Mia. They looked tired, but okay. We made it, Sam said. But the others got caught. We hugged, relieved to be together. Then I told them what I found. Their eyes got wide. We have to do something, Mia said. We all agreed. But what could we do? As we talked, a plan started to form. It was crazy and dangerous. But it might be the aliens' only hope. And maybe Earth's too. We spent days planning. We knew we had to act fast. The government was getting ready to launch their secret ship. We had to beat them. Mia hacked into UAF's system again. She found out where they kept the ship. It was in a hidden base in the desert. Sam had an idea. My uncle has a small plane, he said. We could fly there. It was risky, but we agreed. We packed food, water, and tools. We also took the alien files. Late one night, we snuck to the small airport. Sam's uncle's plane was there. We felt bad about taking it, but it was for a good cause. Sam knew how to fly a little. He started the plane. We took off into the dark sky. The flight was scary. The plane shook a lot. But after a few hours, we saw the desert below. We landed near the secret base. It was huge, with big fences all around. Guards were everywhere. How do we get in? I asked. Mia smiled and pulled out a device. I made this, she said. It can open electronic locks. We waited until night. Then we snuck up to a side gate. Mia used her device. The gate opened. Inside, we hid behind buildings. We saw the ship. It was big and shiny. It looked ready to fly. Now what? Sam whispered. We hadn't thought this far ahead. Suddenly, alarms went off. Lights flashed everywhere. We'd been spotted. Run for the ship! I yelled. We sprinted across the open ground. Guards shouted and ran after us. We reached the ship. Mia's device opened the door. We ran inside and closed it. The inside was amazing. Screens and buttons were everywhere. How do we fly this? Sam asked. I saw a big red button marked autopilot. Without thinking, I pressed it. The ship came to life. Engines roared. We felt it moving. Through the windows, we saw guards trying to stop the ship. But it was too late. We were taking off. The ship shot into the sky. We were pushed back in our seats. The ground got smaller and smaller. Soon we were in space. Earth was a blue ball behind us. We looked at each other amazed. We'd done it. But now what? We didn't know how to fly the ship. And we were heading towards the Dyson Sphere, millions of miles away. Mia found the ship's computer. She started reading. It says the trip will take two weeks, she said. Two weeks in space, we hadn't planned for that. But we couldn't turn back now. As Earth disappeared from view, we realized our adventure was just beginning. We were on our way to meet real aliens. And maybe save them too. 
Two weeks passed, slowly. We learned to use the ship's systems. We ate space food and slept in tiny beds. It wasn't fun, but we were excited. Finally, we saw it. The Dyson Sphere. It was huge, bigger than we imagined. Parts of it were broken, floating in space. As we got closer, we saw lights blinking. It was a message. Mia decoded it. Welcome, Earth friends. Please help. We didn't know how to land on the sphere, but the ship seemed to know. It flew towards a big opening. Inside was amazing. It was like a whole world. We saw cities, forests, and oceans, but everything looked old and broken. The ship landed in a big room. We put on spacesuits just in case. Then we opened the door. A group of aliens was waiting. They looked like tall, blue humans with big eyes. They waved at us. One alien stepped forward. It spoke in a weird voice. Thank you for coming, it said. We are the last of our kind. The alien told us their sad story. Their star was dying. They built the sphere to save themselves. But something went wrong. Now they were trapped. Can you help us leave? The alien asked. We looked at each other. We hadn't expected this. Suddenly we heard a loud noise. Another ship was landing. It was from Earth. Men in uniforms came out. They pointed guns at us. Step away from the aliens! They shouted. We were scared. But then something amazing happened. The aliens stood in front of us. They raised their hands. A blue light came out. The guns floated away. The men looked shocked. The alien leader spoke again. We mean no harm. We only want peace. Everyone was quiet. Then one of the Earthmen stepped forward. We're sorry, he said. We were afraid. Can we start over? The alien nodded. Yes, there is much we can learn from each other. Over the next few days, humans and aliens worked together. We fixed the aliens' ships. They showed us amazing technology. Finally, it was time. The aliens were ready to leave their old home. They invited some of us to go with them, to explore the stars. I looked at Sam and Mia. We all smiled. We knew what we wanted to do. As we boarded the alien ship, I thought about our journey. It started with a crazy week. Now we were going to see the universe. I don't know what we'll find out there, but I know it will be an adventure. And it all started because we were brave enough to help. The end.